Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today uh, and for tonight's uh, amazing panel discussion with myself, Taylor Bythewood Porter, Maya C. Carey, uh, and Lynn Hobbs. Uh, again, uh, tonight's discussion and conversation, we're going to be talking about the exhibition, Rites and Rituals, the Making of African and American Debutante Culture. Um, so for those of you, give a little bit of a description of the program. So uh, as you know, Black debutante culture was explored when Maya Seagree, Presidential Diversity Postdoctoral Fellow at Brighampton University began her research, Carrie's thesis and introduction to the, the significance of African-American cotillions uh, in the mid 20th century served as a really important text for me as I was developing the exhibition, uh, Rites and Rituals, the Making of African-American Debutante Culture. Um, you know, in conjunction with this exhibition, we will be discussing, um, you know, the development of this rite of passage and its historical and cultural significance. Uh, and then we'll also be discussing this with Lynn Hobbs, the president chapter of the Lynx Incorporated, a Black women's club that carries on this tradition today. So just a little bit about some of our um, panelists. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Maya Carey, uh, who received her PhD from Rutgers University, uh, New Brunswick in 2018 and is the Presidential Diversity Postdoctoral Fellow at Brighampton University. In the fall, she will begin her new position at Brighampton as an assistant professor uh, in the Department of History. Carrie's current book project examines the role of social organizations, including debutante organizations, in the coming up uh, in the coming of age of Black girls in Washington D.C. in the 20th century. Carrie's publications include an article in the Washington His uh, in Washington History that explores the relationship between Girl Scouting and the Civil Rights Movement, uh, and co-authored essays in Scarlet and Black Volumes 1 and 2. Most recently, she co-authored White and Marissa J. Uh, Scarlet and Black Volume 3, Making Black Lives Matter at Rutgers, 1945. Uh, more about the Los Angeles chapter of the Lynx, if you all don't know, uh, is an organization, the Lynx Incorporated, and is comprised of more than 16,000 professional women of African descent spreading throughout uh, uh, 292 chapters globally. The Los Angeles chapter owes its long legacy of transformative programming, philanthropy, and uh, community uh, impact to its active members of bright, committed women who are leaders in their professions and come together in friendship uh, for the common purpose of serving those in need. The Los Angeles Chapter Incorporated is the oldest chapter within the Western United States and has dedicated itself to service through, through friendship for 70 years. With its current 52 members and 20 alumna members, it contributes uh, philanthropically through monetary donations and, and transformative programs to educational institutions, uh, social service organizations, and cultural centers throughout Los Angeles. The Los Angeles chapter is best known for its cotillion programming. Next year will be the cotillion 70th anniversary. Today, it is in the midst of its 69th season and has 20 debutantes uh, currently in its program. Lynn Hobbs is the chapter's 36th. Uh, wow, I mean, such amazing panelists. I can't wait to talk to you all uh, and really hear more about the work that you are doing uh, and your thoughts about the, uh, the exhibition and the tradition. Uh, but before we dive into that, I would love to show the audience some images of the exhibition and just give a brief overview of the show. So if you bear with me for one moment, I'm gonna get those slides up and ready.
rites and rituals, the making of African and debutante culture. It was definitely a, a passion project of mine. Uh, up in New Jersey, I was very familiar with uh, debutante uh, various social clubs and societies, and I've always been really fascinated about how they work and how they operate. Um, they're very performative um, when you're just coming to it from the outside. So very much intrigued uh, to see what goes on beneath the earth. And with African American culture, I was amazed and I really wanted to share what I found uh, with the CAM audience. So I had to be able to bring this to you all today. Um, so one of the things that I really found um, you know, really exciting about African culture, really into it, especially in regards to the racial upliftment movement and the women in the 1900s. Um, you know, as the black middle class, as black middle class leaders and activists have dedicated this eat of racial upliftment, you know, the politics argued that black people had the moral authority and right to define themselves to an outside uh, and really claim their own worthiness. Uh, many Black women were critical forces in the development Hi everyone, sorry about that. Technical issues and difficulties on my end. Um, but again, just talk a little bit more about um, the racial upliftment movement and really how it was important for these black women to come to form these organizations um, to really, again, this desire for uh, social reform and policy and really, again, wanting to reinvest in their own community. A uh, way that they did this was really highlighting and really encouraging Black women to, to colleges and universities. Uh, you know, in response with the support from the Reconstruction Era, Freedmen's Bureau, historically backed Black colleges and universities to emerge in the 19th century. Again, sending their black colleges became an effective way for wealthy and aspiring black families to assert their status. Uh, through education, young black women sought professional positions that allowed for greater economic and social mobility. So within the exhibition, you would see images um, with the portrait. You have a 1900 Pirates uh, exposition that was produced by W.E.B. Du Bois, again, kind of showing the, um, you know, the growth of the African-American community enslavement, and again, to show this other image of what it means to be African-American. Uh, and then the other image we have are young students, uh, University of Southern California, Edwin Jefferson, Maddie Perkins, Warner R. Wright, and Lily Nickerson, all pioneer families uh, in Los Angeles, and again, who received this higher education and, and really gave back to the community in a meaningful way. As again, these women are going to college and university and receiving graduate education, personal employment, increase this idea again of economic mobility. 
the clubs provided a platform to broadcast their respectability and a way to connect with other like-minded individuals. They, uh, you know, used it as um, the tickets with black families. They were on the East Coast or West Coast. They would often travel from coast to coast, visiting family members in the Northern or Southern cities. And they would bring back with them traditions and activities such as social clubs. Um, and then again, kind of to, you know, one of these social clubs, again, are our debutante organizations. Uh, and to have a better idea of what a debutante is, it is a young woman making her first appearance in that society. But with African American debutante, again, it was so much more. Uh, it, the debutante and the accompanying ritual epitomized the ideas of racial men, uh, emphasizing uh, morality, duty, and personal responsibility. Uh, and then again, just really showing and present strong family unit. in the cover coverage of these debutante ball uh, and or cotillions, columnists in black newspapers presented a connected and moral family unit. Uh, and they had a story within the within the black. So again, some of the images that you would see within the exhibition uh, to the one side, we had Diane Club. Of the uh, a few of the members within this club ended up um, forming the Los Angeles chapter of the Lynx. But again, you're seeing these women for, um, raising money, trying to really give back to this next uh, generation, this next, um, you know, again, the, yeah, this next generation of women who are coming up. And then to the other side, we have Warner Wright, no longer a student. Uh, and now, again, he's escorting his daughter, Brenda, um, at a One of the main things that I found that was really important with the with American debutante called, again, really showing, uh, you know, positive image of Black women. At the time, you know, uh, and even still sometimes, uh, you know, images of Black women that did exist are often caricatures. And these uh, African American debutante organs pushed back to say that. There to be about that. Um, but again, right, to say these women were coming together again to really show the importance of, of utilizing the Black press um, and to challenge this, these institutional ideas that Black women were innocents. Uh, and also, one of the major opponents of these Black debutante organizations is. Is to really give back to the African American community in which they in which they serve. In a study done by the Kellogg Foundation, it found that African Americans uh, donate twenty five percent more of their uh, per year than to white Americans. Again, to really show how Black people historically developed strong networks of mutual in response to years of combating racism and oppression. Uh, and again, here we'll have images of that we'll see within the exhibition. Again, just showing uh, this again dignity in that these young ladies, uh, and then also highlighting you know members of the 20th Century Onyx Club, and again the work that they doing. Uh, again, money for organizations such as the NAACP or American Red Cross. That kind of to uh, you know what we consider race work, uh, and I think with the Los Angeles chapter of the Lynx, it really highlights that uh, you know with them with with their organization, they have strong ties to the of their founding members were again very active in the NAACP, 
working closely with Governor Pat Brown. And I think for me, the highlight uh, came in 1961 when President John F. Kennedy and Governor Pat Brown came to Cotillion, uh, Los Angeles Links Cotillion, and it was this time the president attended a African-American uh, social uh, of the West Coast, which was a pretty exciting event. And then again, here you'll see um, that we'll see within the exhibition on the one side, we have Nat King Cole and Jay reading some of the ladies. And on the other side, again, we have young women at the 20th Century Onyx Club uh, uh, who are still pretty very much active today. And that's it with my presentation. So I really want to get started with our, our conversation. So I'm so excited for you all to be here. Uh, so me, I just have so many questions for all of you. Um, but I guess we will start off when uh, I hear more about how you came into the Los Angeles chapter, well as a little more career. All right. Um, can you hear me uh, well? Yes. Okay. Good. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. I jo I joined the Los Angeles chapter of the Lynx Incorporated in 2006 by invitation. Uh, my uh, cousin, uh, Nedra Austin, I followed her almost everywhere through uh, her bar associations and um, she invited me into the links with uh, Melanie Harewood, who is a platinum member. They were my sponsors. So in 2006, I joined the links and I didn't quite know what I was getting myself into. Uh, but every year I re-up and I have uh, made my way through the organization until uh, now, about 16 years later, I'm the president. So um, this is a two-year term. I'm in my second year and I, I couldn't have asked for uh, a better experience than uh, being in the links. Um, I was a, an attorney uh, with my, uh, my cousin. Uh, she was an attorney first, so she kind of uh, mentored me. And um, from there, um, I became a deputy district attorney, um, mostly specializing in sex crimes and domestic violence. I found myself always uh, interested in things that affected women and children. Uh, and uh, from there, I made my way onto the bench, and now I'm a, uh, sitting judge in the felony court downtown. So congratulations so much for sharing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Maya, I think I have a follow-up question for you because I feel like a lot of the things that um you know that Lynn just mentioned kind of comes up in your in your research. So can you tell us a little bit more about what you uncovered with your focus on African American debutantes on the East Coast? Um, specifically around Black girlhood? Sure. Um, so I, um, as you mentioned at the beginning, um, I've been working on, you know, research on debutante, on Black debutante culture um, since I was an undergrad. Um, so as I've, you know, developed it from a thesis into a dissertation and now working on a book, um, I've had the opportunity to interview um, a few former debutantes in Washington, D.C. So that's really helped um, kind of sharpen my analysis. Um, so a lot of my findings that I found from that, I've noticed uh, I guess like three major things. Um, so the first thing um, is that uh, for a lot of black families, the debutante ball functioned as a way to socialize their, their daughters. So um, a lot of mothers saw it as a way to prepare them for what they might face um, as uh, specifically like professional black women. Um, and then I also noticed um, that I think, um, for a lot of Black families, they also saw the debutante ball as a way to address this idea of the adultification of Black girls. Um, so uh, 
that basically means this idea that Black girls don't have uh, the certain protections that come with being children. They're not seen as children. Um, but I think that it's important to think about um, the idea of the debutante ball as a way to usher these girls through this transition from girlhood to womanhood and the importance, especially for uh, Black women and girls to celebrate that transition and mark that transition and show that they are children and we should usher them into adulthood. Um, so I think that's also why this ritual is important. Um, and, I, and I also have found through my research, um, it's really uncovered just like what it meant to be a black teenage girl, you know, in the 1950s and 1960s. I've heard so many interesting stories um, from women that I've talked to, you know, from, you know, how their mothers <laughs> encourage them to participate. Um, to, you know, like nervousness about learning the, the bow and how like nervous they were. And, you know, think about when you're a teenage girl and you're really starting to, um, you know, understand and know your body more and the awkwardness that might come or the anxiety that might come with trying to learn how to do the bow. Um, or, you know, when it comes to picking out the dress, which could be a point of contention with teenage girls and, and their mothers um, or choosing an escort. Um, there's women that I spoke to who, are, who for her, like, although her parents chose her escort, she was just excited to be able to socialize with boys. So that part she actually liked. Um, so yeah, there's a lot that, that I've uncovered, but I would say socialization, um, a, a response to this adultification narrative and also just like, learning about kind of like every day um, what black teenage girls in the middle class, things that they experience coming of age. Oh yeah, that's really wonderful. Yeah, I think, you know, when I think about these, you know, the organizations such as the Lynx or, or others, it's really important. Again, I really thinking about this socialization and, and really like this core moment in time when we're thinking about, you know, development, um, professional and just, or just like emotional development, like as they're going through these phases. Uh, Lynn, I would love to know, how do the Los Angeles uh, links contribute to the development of Black girls? And how do, you know, the young women who are, uh, who are going through this process how do you see them use this space for their own joys and explore their own passions? Thank you. And, and Taylor, before I get too far ahead, I just wanna thank you for inviting me and my chapter to be represented not only in the exhibit, but in this conversation as well. So thank you. Uh, the Los Angeles chapter of the Lynx Incorporated has been doing this cotillion programming almost 70 years. And many of the things Maya has spoken about still exist today. The nervousness, the apprehension, the um, um, socialization that comes. And what I, I think uh, is why we keep having uh, debutantes year after year after year is because we serve a, a need and a purpose. Um, and one of that is that, uh, for instance, last year with the social unrest uh, and with the historic election, uh, the debutantes did a campaign, a social media campaign to help elect the first uh, vice president, uh, Kamala Harris. It wasn't, uh, we're, we're not a partisan organization, so it was really just to get out to vote. Um, and uh, also we did a, um, we talked about social unrest and the girls got to talk to one another and they saw that they had very similar experiences in high school. A lot of them are uh, high achievers in their high schools. Uh, some of them are um, alone as far as their ethnicity uh, and other classmates. And when they finally got together from diverse high schools, all high achievers, and they spoke, they saw that there was so much commonality there. And they bonded on a level that um, only African-American women can do because uh, quite frankly, we hold a very unique um, demographic in Los Angeles and the United States and the world. So um, by being around professional women, which our chapter is uh, professional women dedicated to 
these girls, not only our, our debutantes, but the other programs that we do. Um, they are not only mentored, um, but they're understood and uh, they go on to have lifelong friendships. And so uh, we've seen a lot of creativity come out of uh, our debutantes as well as a lot of friendships, lifelong ones. And they bring back their children who become debutantes. So uh, we're pretty proud of our program. Yeah, that's fantastic. I know just having this understanding of, uh, you know, and we'll dig into a little bit more later of like some of the programming uh, that you offer these young women. It's just really exciting. and. That kind of leads me to my next question for, for Maya. You know, I know within the exhibition, we talk about, uh, you know, the ethos of, of racial up, upliftment. Uh, in what ways do you see that manifested in, in African-American debutante organizations? Uh, yeah, one of the, the ways that I see it, and you pointed out in the presentation earlier, was, um, was uh, philanthropy. Um, so, Historically, Black women's organizations have always poured into their communities, um, whether it's you know raising money or just offering uh, services to uh, other Black people. Um, and the fact that a lot of these debutante balls are sponsored by women's organizations, um, where debutante programming is just like one kind of arm of what they do. Um, and it's an extension of kind of like the service work that they do within their communities. Um, so the funds raised oftentimes, at least historically from these debutante balls, typically um, is funneled back into the community in some way. Um, so that's one way that we see it. Um, and then another way that we see it um, is this is something that you also mentioned in the beginning, but this idea of, um, you know, changing how we think about like imagery of black women um, and also like black families as a whole. Um, so I look a lot at the Girlfriends organization. Um, and I know one of the women who um, led uh, one of their debutante balls in like the mid 1960s talked about how she saw it as a way to um, instill pride within African Americans in the nation's capital, um, and changing how we see, you know, black families as, you know, these stable units. Because the debutante ball very much was a family event. It wasn't just about the debutante herself, but about her parents as well. Um, so, I I think that's one way that you can uh, see it as an act of uplift is kind of expanding how we think about the way black families look. Yeah, that's really interesting. You know, something that you kind of mentioned again that within you know these uh, African American debutante organizations, you know, again they are raising money, they're raising funds, um, and they're really giving back in this uh, in a meaningful and a, and also a monetary way. Um, and that kind of goes to you know a question that I have for for you, Lynn, um, as debutante organizations kind of function as these important sites for uplift and civil rights work. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about some of the, the programming that you offer to these young women um, and the community service that the Los Angeles chapter does? Okay, well, <clears throat> kind of historically, uh, when we first offered the cotillion in 1952, it, it didn't have a volunteer component, but quickly we, adapt, we saw the need for our uh, debutantes to uh, give back to the community and, and see that way before community service was something that high schools and colleges uh, recommend, we've been doing it uh, for, for decades. So uh, we did a... Uh, all of the girls are required to do a certain number of community service hours, and it would have to be with a not-for-profit organization. Once COVID happened, we decided to bring our community service in-house. And uh, because we're, our foundation is a 501c3, we could uh, then uh, do our outreach um, by uh, having all of the debutantes go for a single purpose. 
and that's aligned with our purposes and together boots on the ground the links and the debutantes hand in hand would be doing uh, community service for the common good. But our uh, members log about 3000 hours of community service every year, uh, just e even apart from the cotillion. And our, our community service is a uh, program at 54th Street School where uh, we offer um, uh, poetry, arts, health and human services, international trends. We have a pen pal project. Um, our, our philanthropy goes as far as Uganda, where we uh, have a fistula camp and partnership to do obstetric uh, fistula, and we provide surgical procedures and meals for women. Um, our outreach over the years has uh, financially helped Spelman College, um, Charles R. Drew Medical Center and School, UCLA, we have endowments there. Uh, St. Anne's has, has been one of our most recent partners and we're very happy to, to be aligned with them. Uh, so our, uh, that's what we do. We, uh, our, it's friendship through service and we find that uh, our friendship is deepened by doing service together, uh, working together uh, to help our communities. Really exciting. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that about within the exhibition uh, is again, this really importance of, of really being able to give back um, and especially really being able to give back to the black community. Um, so I have a question, I kind of have like a two part question, um, you know, with utilizing uh, black press and, and business community, again, it came up a lot in my research, um, Maya, uh, for you first, I would love, can you tell me a little bit more about why that is significant that these organizations are using black press? Um, and again, kind of talking about this, uh, this ecosystem uh, around black businesses. Sure. And if we're talking about the, you know, mid 20th century, it's, you know, African Americans at this point, they're reading mainstream newspapers, but the black press is really important. Um, and not just spreading local news, but also national happenings. Um, and it gave Black people a space to do reporting and journalistic work and share what was happening in their communities in ways that was not in ways that were not open in mainstream newspapers. Um, so I think when we're talking about the Black press in terms of its relationship to the debutante ball, I mean, that was kind of the bedrock of a lot of my sources as well, because that's where we're seeing these conversations. But I think that it's important to keep in mind that the Black press was written for a Black audience. So if we're talking about, um, or if we look at, at the debutante ball, um, one of the functions was the way to instill racial pride. Um, that's one argument that you can make. Um, so the fact that they're speaking directly to a black audience and they're showing, you know, these girls in these beautiful gowns um, and, you know, talking about the achievements uh, of the debutantes themselves, but also of, of their families. Um, we can see the black press as a tool that organizers use to, um, you know, push this expanded narrative of what blackness looks like. Um, and also again, like instilling pride within readers or for some readers, it could have been an escape um, who may not have had access to the ritual. Um, it could have just offered like a, um, you know, a way of escape or like fantasy because it is a very elaborate and romantic tradition. Um, so we can look at it that way as well. Wonderful. And then for for Lynn, how is this relevant today? Are you still uh, activating the Black press? How are you working with Black businesses in the community, um, you know, whether it be for floral arrangements? Like, how are, how are you really reinvesting? Uh, we've always... Uh reinvested in the Black community. I mean, even our first cotillion in 1952, we bought a lifetime membership to the NAACP. Uh, so we've, uh, all of our charitable giving has been to a component of community where Black people are served one way or another. We still use the Black press today. The Los Angeles Sentinel 
boast about a, 125,000 uh, uh, subscribers. And, and every year we put our uh, cotillion um, program or our, our cotillion spread in, in their newspaper. Um, we have uh, a member whose uh, mother, Jessie Mae Beavers, was a columnist. So uh, we have always um, not only used the Black press, but um, had a partnership in, in a way with the Black press because we see um, it as promoting uh, the best of, of Black culture. So uh, Black businesses, uh, we use um, floral, uh, we use the dan uh, choreographers who, who are African American. Uh, it just so happened that you know over over the years, all of these uh, are, are graphic artists and, and printers just happen to be black businesses, um, people we know and trust, um, who we've established relationships with. So uh, a lot of things have changed, but a lot has remained the same and. Um, we are uh, recycling those dollars uh, back into the black community. That's wonderful. Uh, and then I kind of have like a, a follow up question for you. Um, you know, again, the links, the Los Angeles chapter of the links in, in particular is just so dedicated, again, reinvesting in the black community and again, investing in uh, these young women, um, you know, and again, just really kind of uh, uh, developing these successful black, black women. Uh, I guess my question for you is how have these organizations focused again, just on the, the young women who are, are going through the cotillion process, but how do you see it also benefit the, the women members of the organization? I would love to see, hear a little bit more about that other side um, of being a member and then also being a, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, let me just tell you that um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention our leadership institute that we do. So in order to, the cotillion is in and of itself a celebration of having, and, and I like how Maya calls it a ritual because it is, um, but, but prior to that, we have the leadership institute. And um, that right now is head by Denise Burnett, who uh, has done a fabulous job curating um, workshops for our debutantes. And uh, what is so fabulous about it also is that we have such talent in our own um, chapter that a lot of the speakers end up being either uh, one of the chapter members or a friend of a chapter member. Uh, but uh, what I find so um, rewarding about doing the cotillion every year is that uh, we learn from these uh, high school seniors. Uh, we learn the, what's happening with them today. We learn how to be current, how to relate, how to communicate. We learn how to be digitally sophisticated. Um, we are constantly trying to adapt to what they need in order to be relevant. And I think for 70 years, you know, of all the changes that have happened since 1952, we have done a pretty good job with listening to our audience and, and, and trying to do the best we can uh, to keep ourselves uh, in tune with uh, being relevant and um, producing emerging leaders. And we think we uh, have done that. Wonderful. Yeah, I think, you know, that that mentorship is is very important. Uh, and it's just great that these organizations, you know, are able to really provide that. Um, I have a bit of a challenging question. Um, so Mai, we can start with you. Um, you know, just kind of talking about African American debutante culture for those who are unaware um, of the, again, like, the elements of, of upliftment surrounded by it. I feel like terms like elitist or assimilation into white culture are often kind of used to describe uh, social organizations such as debutante organizations. Um, how do you address those types in your work? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, that's something that I 
I tackle head on in my work um, because I understand where the critiques are coming from. And, you know, I, I do think that they are valid critiques. And I think that good history um, is critical, um, but it can also be cel celebratory, but it should also be critical at the same time. Um, so, you know, things like uh, class, um, exclusivity, um, those are all things that I explore and talk about in my work and you know the idea of who gets to debut and who gets to be you know the face of the you know cream of the crop of African Americans so that's something that I I think is worthy talking about um, and I don't shy away from that and I think that it's important to explore those things um, but I will say as a historian I think because of the ideas associated with the debutante ball is a lot of the reason why it hasn't received adequate historical treatment because people just dismiss it as an elite uh, ritual and therefore it's not important. Um, but I think that we should, you know, make room for, you know, multiple ideas and truths. Um, and while we're talking about the critiques, we should also think about the value that Black women or girls may have extracted um, from the debutante ball. I think that those are also important to discuss. Um, and again, in thinking about, you know, what the, what the intentions of parents or, you know, mothers in particular might have been um, in wanting their daughters to get involved. Um, you know, I talk about the mid 20th century. So, you know, Jim Crow civil rights era, um, Black mothers were keenly aware of a lot of um, just the difficulties that their daughters would face um, becoming Black or being Black women or being Black professional women. And I think they saw this as a way to prepare them for that. Um, so again, like I would like to say that, yes, let's discuss these critiques, um, but also thinking about like the value that Black families might have gotten from it as well. Yeah, I think that's really wonderful. Uh, Lynn, can you tell me a little bit how you feel? Um, <clears throat> I find it hard to think that Black women can be elitist. We're at the bottom of the demographic when it comes to almost everything. We don't get uh, promoted the same rate as other uh, our counterparts. Uh, we um, <clears throat> uh, pay the most for cars. Uh, it, we pay the most for mortgages. So it's hard for me to believe that um, uh, something that uh, Black women do for other Black women could be elitist. But I understand that there is that critique, and I, I think it it's, can be divisive or uh, um, uh, misunderstood. Uh, Veda Somerville was our first president of the Los Angeles chapter. Uh, she was the first dentist, uh, black woman dentist out of USC. Her husband was the first black dentist out of USC. And uh, when he entered USC, with, uh, the white classmates went to the dean and said, we will withdraw and resign from the school if you don't kick out John Somerville. So the Dean said, okay, uh, Mr. Somerville, come on in. I want you to address these, uh, your classmates who want you kicked out. John Somerville addressed them, shamed them. And uh, the Dean said, if you don't want to be in the same class with John Somerville, you can leave. Well, no one left. John Somerville ended up uh, being first in his class and, and, and scored highest in his, uh, Board, but she ended up marrying him. She became a dentist as well. And this is the background that our first president had, exclusion. Um, he couldn't travel uh, and stay at a hotel, so they built a hotel. So yes, they, they were given things, but she uh, was a civil rights activist. Um, she, uh, one of our members say, bloom where you're planted. She bloomed where she was planted. So uh, to say that professional black women um, can't do something uplifting or can't do something um, like a ball to uh, 
other to to younger black women and that's elitist i i, I just don't i don't see that as um, ringing true for me uh, but what i do see is that the women that we pour ourselves into come from different socioeconomic backgrounds some of them um have their, uh, some of them borrow dresses. Some of them uh, have um, financial help. If they want to become a debutante, they become one. And um, every year we, we have a goodly number of people because um, we care about uh, uh, their future and, they, and we believe that they'll be leaders. And just like Maya said, they're going to face racism it could be covert, it could be overt. They're going to face sexism and racism and uh, professional black women that we believe they'll become and they have become. Uh, they need to know where their uh, source is and their source is uh, from the histories of people like Veda Somerville, like Margaret Hawkins and Sarah Strickland Scott who started the Lynx uh, Incorporated. There are black women who are pulling for them and um, I think just knowing that um, helps, uh, helps their uh, chances of not only being successful, but of being uh, leaders themselves in the race work that still needs to be done. That was wonderful. Yeah, I, com I completely agree. I found that within this exhibition, doing the research and seeing what uh, the links are doing, again, it's preparing these young women uh, for what's on the horizon uh, to, uh, again, there's, there's so many opportunities to be able to participate through scholarship, um, through, you know, various chapters, you know, it, uh, I, I, I love the links, but there are so many other, you know, debutante organizations out there that fit various, uh, you know, economic statuses or, or locations. Again, Los, uh, the Los Angeles chapter was the first West Coast chapter of the Lynx, but over its history, you're seeing chapters in Inglewood, in Pasadena, again, just offering more access to, um, you know, to more young women. And again, to really build this uh, Black female empowerment force uh, that, you know, we're seeing today and, and, and more. Um, uh, so to wrap up before we open it up to questions from the audience, uh, Maya, I would love to know, you know, I kind of a little bit about some of the research projects that you are uh, working on in your internet, but a little bit more about what kind of projects you're working on now. Sure. So right now, uh, the biggest thing I'm working on is my first book. Um, so I'm in the process now, thank you, <laughs> um, of revising my dissertation into a book. Um, and broadly, it explores um, the relationship between organizations such as the Girl Scouts, the YWCA, as well as debutante organizations. Um, the significance of these spaces in the coming of age of black girls. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of times we uh, read histories of black girlhood um, and we think about coming of age is typically through the lens of trauma or traumatic events, you know, racial violence and sexual violence. Um, but I was really interested in, okay, we, we know this, um, that violence is you know, prevalent in young black lives. Um, but in what ways did these social organizations, uh, you know, try to support, nurture, um, and shape, uh, you know, black girls coming of age? So, you know, in their teenage years, but also what did the black girls themselves extract from these organizations? Um, so that's what I'm working on right now. Oh, I'm so excited. I can't wait for the book to come out. Uh, and then Lynn, well, one question for you. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, the upcoming cohort? Uh, what are some of these young women uh, looking forward to do? You know, are, are, have they already selected what colleges or universities? Like what's on the horizon for young black women and debutante organizations? What can we look forward to? Okay, so um, right now uh, they have been treated to uh, Dr. Terrence Roberts did a private conversation with him with they did with him. He is one of the Arkansas nine 
who uh, were escorted by the police or the sheriff or the, was it the marshals uh, to uh, integrate Arkansas High School. Uh, so they had a lengthy uh, conversation with him that went really well. They've already uh, met with uh, uh, Monica Dupriez, who, who helped them do college essays. Um, they have uh, did an empowerment, uh, uh, international empowerment seminar. They have the uh, CAM exhibit to look forward to. Uh, they also have um, their... Uh, legal savvy, social media. Um, we strengthen their writing and public speaking and uh, their community service is coming up. So uh, they get they get a well-rounded um, education. Um, they, they learn about fiscal responsibility and uh, they we broaden their appreciation of arts um, so uh, and of their African American heritage. That's wonderful. I know when I look at see uh look and see what some of the things that they have on the horizon and the programs I'm like I wish I had that <laughs> when I was going it's like oh I had to learn how to find yeah. the hard way I, I'm sorry that it's virtual that's the only yeah uh, that's the only problem is that our our national organization says it still has to be virtual so um so it's a little bit of a downer but we're hoping we can get everyone together at some point when all of this lifts Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so now I'm going to check to see what questions we have from the audience. Let's see. Uh, okay, have any of us a debutante? It's if so, what uh, want to share? Oh. I guess I'll go first. Um, I was not a debutante. I wish I was. Um, I was though, so I kind of got a little taste. Uh, but you know, African American debutante culture is is definitely something that I always wanted to be a part of. Again, it's the this it's this beautiful magical moment, right? That you see these, these lovely young ladies just, uh, you know, just floating down the stairs, the curtsy, um, and just, again, having a deeper understanding of the process and what they get to learn along the way. Uh, yeah, I definitely wish I was a debutante. Um, um. Maya, are you speaking? Uh, yeah, uh, so I was not a debutante. Yeah. I just study them. Um, <laughs> and I wasn't really even uh, familiar with the tradition um, until I started working on my thesis, which grew out of a conversation with my advisor whose daughter um, was going to be part of the cotillion. So um, yeah, I haven't been one. <laughs> Well, I think the air is about to totally go out of the room because I haven't been a debutante either. <laughs> um, but my father, uh, we have um, six girls in the family and uh, my father just was not going to do that expense to uh, make me a debutante. But my cousin Nedra was and a lot of my friends were. And as soon as my uh, niece became eligible, she was a debutante and to um, experience what she experienced and just the magical nature of it all, um, getting dressed up, dancing on the dance floor, just seeing her so happy. And uh, she still has friends from that day. I know when my girls get old enough, they'll definitely be debutantes and it's something that I, that I regret. Uh, but uh, alas, with six girls, it just was not in the cards for me. Yeah, uh, let's see. I, I do have something else to add, uh, if I may, Taylor. Yeah, absolutely. I know that um, people think we're a social organization, but uh, we consider ourselves a philanthropic organization of service. Uh, we, While we do have a... Um, uh, one of our core values of friendship. Um, it's definitely, they take a pound of flesh of you every year and it's not a uh, social organization at, at, at all. 
Uh, so even though our signature program is the cotillion, as you said, other chapters have other signature programs. It's just that ours has been the cotillion for almost 70 years. So I just wanted to uh, make that clear. And then also um, we, we do do HBCU, uh, we do human trafficking, social media. So uh, those are all of the leadership workshops we do as well. So I just wanted to I got a text that I didn't say everything I should have, so I had to. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, I got so many fun ones. Uh, let's see. How do participants, past and present, factor in the community created by the Los Angeles chapter of the Lynx via the Cotillion? So I guess that would be for you, Lynn. If I understand this, um, well, we stay in touch with our past debutantes. Um, one of our um, past debutantes who come frequently to help us out uh, with either narration or um, an uplifting talk is uh, news anchor Leslie Sykes on the Channel 7 News um, in the morning. She was a debutante. Uh, we also have uh, debutantes who are artists, and uh, we avail ourselves to um, their help at times. Um, so uh, parents come back um, to, uh, sometimes they become our chapter members, sometimes uh, they uh, are helpful in other ways. We have so many tentacles out there that anyone who wants to be part of our community can basically be a part of our community because we, we can find a, a purpose. Yeah, I, I definitely found that out too. Uh, you know, just talking to one, one member, you're like, you're, you're automatically connected to all these other people like, oh, well, I know somebody. So I just, I really love that. Again, service uh, through friendship. Uh, let's see. Oh, wow. Yeah, so many great questions. Like, oh, which one do I choose? Um, I think this was more of like a historical question. Uh, so maybe this will be for me. Do you think value since 1900, boys said there were less women graduates compared to men graduates? Uh, do you mind repeating the first part of the question? Because your sound kind of went out, so I couldn't yeah. un understand. Or yeah, is the question in, in the chat? I can look there, too. Uh, I'll read it again. Do you think Black women recognized their value since the 1900s uh, when Du Bois said that there were uh, less women graduates than male graduates? So I guess it's to say, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because now they say Black women are the backbone for the Democratic uh, Party. So I guess, how are you seeing Black women in education through uh, debutante organizations? Okay, so to address the uh, first part of the question, I think it was about Black women recognizing their value. Black women have always recognized their value. Um, so that's something that's not new. Um, you know, from enslavement to today, Black women have always recognized their, their, their value. So I wanna emphasize that. Um, and then, sorry, just the last part of the question again. <laughs> oh yeah, um, and I think the last part is just again to show how, you know, now they're saying that Black women are the backbone for the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, so, so I, I guess you can link that to the debutante ball. Um, again, the fact that uh, while there were a couple of men's organizations who sponsored debutante balls, I know in Washington D.C. that was certain that was certainly the case. Um, but overwhelmingly, these uh, traditions are carried on by Black women, and I think that this is just another way to show how um, Black women show up for their communities. Um, not just for their own children, but for their communities. Um, if we're also look, looking at the, the philanthropic um, aspect. Um, and they're the ones that are developing black girls. So just like they're the backbone 
of the Democratic Party today, as some people say, um, they're also the backbone of our communities and they've supported our communities in various ways um, through civic work, you know, through organizations such as the Lynx or the National Council of, of Negro Women. A lot of these um, Black women's organizations have really carried our communities. Wonderful. Uh, let's see. Well, I guess we'll do, uh, Maya, we'll do a, a quick plug for you. A lot of people want to know how can they access your thesis? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't even think it's, it's digitized. I would say to wait for the book because my analysis and writing has gotten so much better since I wrote that 10 years ago. So just wait for that. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. And then, uh, for Lynn, people would love to know what's the criteria or process for entry uh, into the links? What was it like, um, if you can speak on, what was it like in the 1950s uh, for the chapter and then what is it like now? Okay. Um, but one book, uh, Taylor, that you recommended that I read, I ended up getting and reading and it was very good. Oh, um, wonderful. Yeah, right. so I'll let everyone Richardson know. Richardson or something like that? It was um, uh, The Season yeah, by Kristen yeah. Richardson. And Maya has a few inserts in there as well. So again, wow. again, I love that crossover. Yes, yes. Um, well, in the 1950, uh, the, the chapter began by, um, we had a, a member who brought women over for tea and that was Marjorie McPherson. And uh, she asked people uh, who would be, who would wanna be a member of a um, organization that was making its way throughout the East Coast. And about 18 charter members then began the Los Angeles chapter of the Lynx. Two years later, they started the Cotillion program. And uh, that has uh, been, uh, it's been in existence now uh, ever since. In the beginning, uh, the Los Angeles chapter was considered uh, prestigious to be in because it was the only chapter in Los Angeles and it became a popular um, chapter and the links became popular as it became more visible. Uh, but then other chapters uh, joined us. Um, we have Inglewood, Palos Verdes, Harbor area, um, we have uh, one in West Covina, Altadena, Pasadena. Uh, I know I, I shouldn't have started saying them, San Fernando, because I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, miss one uh, unintentionally, Beverly Hills. So um, all of us do tremendous work and uh, we consider ourselves a cluster. Um, so the way that uh, people get in these organizations are to be um, to get to know the members and then see if it's a good fit. And then the members would invite you into the organization. Um, that's traditionally uh, how uh, the membership ha has worked. Um, they, you have to, because it's a friendship organization, you have to be a friend of a friend <laughs> yeah, of one of the friends to, to get in because everyone tries to work um, um, through their in friendship for a common goal. I hope that answers it. Yeah, I think it definitely does. Um, oh my God, yeah, I'm just, there's so many questions. They're all really good. Uh, okay, we talked about book recommendations. Uh, okay, so maybe this could be for you, Maya. Uh, given the, yeah, in, in your research, what you found, given the history of elitism and colorism with some of these debutante organizations. Uh, have any of these balls reconciled with the history and how have they uh, democratized access, uh, access compared to before? Yeah, so I can speak to the historical aspect of that because um, I'm not quite sure today how organizations have reckoned with that past. Um, but I'm, I'm glad that that question was asked because I, I do think that it's an important one. 
Um, and at the period that I'm studying, you know, it's, if you look at photographs, like it's very apparent that a lot of the girls are light skinned. Um, you know, a lot of them come from, you know, their parents were doctors, lawyers, you know, teachers, which was considered part of the black elite at that time. Um, so I, I do think that that is an important part of the history that, uh, you know, organizations that are continuing the tradition that they do think about that. Um, and from what I heard uh, Lynn describe, it does sound like it has become more democratized um, over time, but I consider that certainly wasn't really the case in the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s. Um, so I, I hope that, um, you know, moving forward that these organizations do talk about that. Um, yeah, so maybe Lynn can speak more to how things have like specifically changed over time. But as a historian, I can say that, you know, part of my role is to reckon with that. Um, and I certainly do that with in, in my work. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, the debutante culture, uh, the white debutante culture was to establish um, families, the prominence of families, the money, having their daughters marry well, which is not what the African-American debutante culture is all about. I think Maya has succinctly stated um, what the uh, goals are uh, for um, the debutante ritual. Uh, so uh, as far as uh, that history, um, going way back, uh, I don't think we ever were there. Um, Black people have always um, created their own um, rituals and 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 um, <clears throat> and uh, traditions. So, uh, as far as um, the way that our chapter has evolved, I, I recognize that um, some. You'll look at some of the earlier photos, and you'll see fair-skinned uh, women and fair skin uh, debutantes, but not all. Um, but over time, I think one of our members, uh, she didn't, we don't really call them debutantes. Only, and, and that was to address some of the elitist criticism that um, uh, we have heard. So uh, we call them cotillionettes. So we don't even um, coin the same phrase debutante. So you will hear in our chapter, and every time we type it into a, a document, it'll get a red line underneath it because it's not a word. Uh, but it's not a, a word they recognize, but we recognize it in, in the LA chapter. We call our, our debutantes cotillionettes because we want it to shy away from um, uh, any idea that we thought that uh, this was some kind of privileged class because that's not what it was about at all. We also introduced the service, community service component. I, I, I talked about that um, and, and we fine tuned it. Then we added uh, the leadership institute component. So um, we are, are constantly um, evolving to uh, make sure that uh, we're cognizant of the idea that um, people could think that it's um, for privileged girls. It is not. Uh, whoever wants to be a debutante, usually they're looking for, um, they're looking for fun. They're looking for, um, they're, they're usually high achievers. They want to uh, see other high achievers. They want to hear about colleges and how to get into colleges. They want to hear about, they, they want to live their best lives. And um, this is one of the rituals uh, that uh, uh, they believe does that. And we believe it, we offer that as well, is that this is one of the pathways to see uh, what your future can behold. It's almost like a, um, it's almost like a, <laughs> what do they call that? A monocle. <laughs> Telescope into the future. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, oh, I love that. Um, I kind of have a question for you, uh, Lynn. I'm going to rephrase it a little bit. 
so does the, uh, does, a, the, the uh, does the 100 black men organization still exist and if so are they still involved are they still involved with the links and i know i know the the links has a uh, what was it the achievers organization or like some uh, an offshoot do the links often work with um you know uh i guess the male young the the young male counterpart uh of cotillionettes yes and that's the link chapter i forgot when i said uh, oh i forgot one angel city <clears throat> uh -huh. angel city does have the achievers program and in fact uh I'll be signing my son up for it. I cannot wait. And I was um, so disappointed he couldn't be an escort this year because um, fathers want their sons to be escorts uh, to our debutantes. I mean, it is a camaraderie that we have and um, uh, we enjoy it immensely. And they have a, 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 a program that uh, has gotten awards. So uh, they have the... Um, probably the male counter, counterpart, if you will, even though ours is different. Uh, it definitely uh, theirs is uh, for uh, aspiring gentlemen. Wonderful. Uh, let's see. Oh, Thing. This is an interesting one. Uh, has Dev evolved to be inclusive towards gender or her expressions? Uh, Lynn, if you can answer that. And then Maya, if you can talk a little bit more about your research around that, because I remember you were mentioning something about um, within one of your writings, uh, again, this like showing this connected family unit and um, those kind of gender roles. But Lynn, if you wanted to go first. Well, um, <clears throat> we have, uh, um, you, Maya's completely correct that the whole family gets involved with um, uh, the cotillion. Um, the mothers, the fathers are just as excited. Uh, we love the, the daughter-father dance, uh, but we have families that look differently. That's just African-American families and we accept that and we, and we understand that. So um, for instance, we changed our mother-daughter tea to the cotillion tea because not everyone's gonna bring their mother. They might bring uh, a father, an uncle, a, an aunt. So um, we are inclusive. We always will be inclusive. Um, we haven't had, um, I, I'm, I'm, what was the question about gender expression? Is that what I heard? Yeah, how how are, uh, I guess, well, how are the links just being more inclusive with different gender expressions? We're an inclusive organization, point blank. Wonderful. And then Maya, if you can speak a little bit more historically uh, in the past, right? Different than the, than the now, the links are doing, so I want to put that out there. Uh, how has it been perceived, how has it been, I guess, thought of in the, in the past in, uh, when you're looking at the late 1800s, early 1900s. Yeah, so even if we're looking into, you know, the, the mid 20th century, um, because it's so much, again, in the mid 20th century, um, because it was so much about um, showcasing a strong, like nuclear black family, it was very, heterosexual in nature so the emphasis was on you know having a strong father having you know a male escort um so in the past uh, you know it wasn't open to various um gender expressions um and that's something that i definitely think is important to talk about um in ways that you know we can uh you know, make the tradition more inclusive in the present day, um, because that certainly wasn't the case in the past. Um, and in my interviews, I, I haven't come across, um, you, you know, uh, you know, like queer young, young women, but I do hold space in my work to think about what it would have been for a girl who, you know, was not heterosexual and what that would have been like to be in that environment that wasn't necessarily 
inviting to you know who she is um so i think that's definitely something important to think about and i hope that you know organizations sponsoring it today are really thinking about that and really thinking about what it means to be inclusive and it's not just about class but also thinking about you know in in the past debbie tom balls you know very much so um they elevated traditional ideas of femininity and feminine gender expression. Um, but I think today we kind of have to think about how that is, you know, limiting um, and thinking about like the ways that we can think about black womanhood and girlhood in a more expansive way. Wonderful. And then I'll just do maybe two, two more questions before we wrap up. Um, so Lynn, I guess this, maybe this will be for you. Do you find that young African American women have winning interests in being debutantes? No, I haven't found that yet to be true. Um, every year, uh, last year was a little different um, because of uh, the COVID. Um, we had to pivot, so we had uh, 13 girls, which was on the smaller side, but it, usually we have between 16 and 22 girls every year and we have a wait list sometimes. Uh, so I have not found uh, that to be the case, thankfully. <laughs> but I think it's a testament also to the good program that, that we have and, and how relevant and, and timely and current it is. Wonderful, yeah. I, uh, when I get asked that question too, I'm like, no, it's still like, oh, are debutantes organization still around? Still exists, I'm like, yeah. yeah, they're still around. I'm like, they, they're very much here. They're all over the country. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, you just ask, you can just ask one person if they were a dev, and then all of a sudden you'll get like this, a uh, spider. My mother was a debutante. Yeah. So. Yeah. Like, my cousin was, they were here. My grandmother was, and uh, they'll, they'll, they'll pop out of the woodworks. Yeah. It's very act. Uh, again, it's it's it it offers so much um, much to the young women, uh, mm -hmm. and like yeah, take take advantage of that. Get take advantage of those networks, those opportunities Network. to yeah. explore and grow. Uh, and, and in a way, yeah. Taylor, with women becoming so professional and becoming so educated, and then going to HBCUs around the country and colleges around the country, it is a networking because later on, you don't know who that debutante might be in, in 30 years, 20 years, and how those ties will connect you, even if that debutante wasn't uh, the same year as you, just to say it was an LA chapter debutante, that's a connection right there. So this is the kind of golf course thing that men used to do all the time. Um, so I, I, I just don't um, buy that, uh, it's an aging thing that is unpopular. It's, it's a way that Black women of like minds uh, can connect and, and, and start a network. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's just, for me, I find it, it's, 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 it's an enriching opportunity if somebody's able to be able to go through that process um, or even just take advantage even again just being able to go through the exhibition or just having that awareness that it's out there mm -hmm. uh, let's see one more question um let's see was there ever uh so for maya was there ever a backlash to black social women's groups from white social women's groups um, not that I'm aware of. I, I, I haven't come across that in my research. Um, because I mean, this was really, I mean, they, they were separate. So, you know, you had white debutante balls, you had black debutante balls, and there was really no, they didn't see any need to kind of like cross pollinate. Um, so from what I found, I haven't seen backlash, but that doesn't say that it didn't happen. I, I just haven't found that. Yeah, I think the only backlash came when Black women tried to integrate white social groups. Yeah. I <laughs> In the beginning. No, yeah, absolutely. I feel like, um, you know, when I'm talking about these 
you know, the differences in these organizations, I really, yeah, just have to point out, like, there was a real difference between Black Debbie's Fat organizations and Fat organizations. Uh, you know, eventually there there was uh, an overlap, you know, in the, you know, 60s and 70s, think about this, um, you know, second wave feminism and, and again, re readdressing that kind of structure. But historically, again, um, Black women's groups were always really focused uh, on education and service. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you, uh, ladies, for joining me today and, and having this discussion. Uh, again, talking about uh, the history, the rites and rituals and digging into more of these like complex histories. I'm so glad to be able to share all that information with our viewers today. Uh, and then for those who weren't able to attend, it is going to be available on our YouTube channel uh, later this week. So you can share it with friends and family to have a little bit more understanding about African-American uh, debutante culture. And so I just wanted to say again, thank you all so much. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you, thank you Maya. You guys thank are great. <laughs> Wonderful. Bye, everyone. Have a great Bye -bye. evening.